Hello, welcome to episode number 98 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and the guy laughing in the background is my co-host, Vala Offshore. Vala, how are you today? Michael, I'm doing, I'm doing great and uh, anticipating another foot of snow in, a, in another day or so. So this has been a pretty, uh, pretty uh, white uh, environment around Boston area. Yeah, I know. It's like, you know, can I can I curse on the show? Is that allowed? Do we allow uh, that or no? <laughs> it's PG, so no. <laughs> okay. So so I I on Facebook I put the snow because <laughs> it was snowing, and all these people started like commenting. But now we're getting like another. We've had like these feet of snow. We're like inundated with snow. We are, and, uh, but the best best part of all this is we get to end the week talking to an extraordinary entrepreneur and technologist and, and photographer, so please, Michael, with the introductions. So on episode number 98, we, are, we have as our guest today Chris Michael, who is a serial entrepreneur. He's also invested in a bunch of companies and is really a, one of the great Photographers, you you are Chris. Without a doubt, you are like the you are the photographer without a doubt in Silicon Valley and among technology people in this country. And we're thrilled that you're here with us. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm uh, I'm disappointed that I'm not episode number one hundred, and I appreciate the incredibly qualified view of my superlative. You know, you are the top photographer in South of Market area in technology that uses the Leica camera. And I claim that and own that space as my very own. So within a right. mile radius of San Francisco. You know. Okay. So I think this has been a great show. And, uh, well okay. you're right. It's been difficult. This is gonna be a tough hour. Okay, so let's start over. You know, Chris <laughs> Michael is I love Chris Michael's photography, and we're going to do a unique thing today, which is uh, before the show is over, we're actually going to see a slideshow. Chris sent me a bunch of his photos. Really, really, they're great. And he's going to talk through like a, just a, the story of some of these. So, but, but first, Chris, why don't we begin and tell us about your, tell us briefly about your professional background and some of the highlights of the many, many things that you have done. Well, well thanks. Uh, it really is an honor to be here, and um, well, I, I guess I'd say you know I'm 47 now, and you know it sneaks up on you. And, and as I look back, I've had a pretty unusual life, maybe a life that I didn't expect to have. Um, I've had three really distinct careers. Um, so I flew airplanes for the Navy as a navigator. So I, uh, after Top Gun, I was very interested in joining the Navy, thinking maybe I wanted to go into politics, and I uh, flew on P3 Orions. I'm trained to hunt Soviet submarines. Uh, spent a lot of time doing the drug, and after that, I went to work in the Pentagon. Um, uh, during that time, so I went to the University of Illinois and was in the Navy. And as I said, I was in the Pentagon. My level of interest in business was zero. So I, I had never taken a business class. Um, I probably didn't know the word entrepreneurship. I was not compelled, and the Navy was going to send me to the Kennedy School at Harvard, which was kind of a kind of a big deal because I'd gone to State College at Illinois and um, basically through a kind of serendipitous set of events I ended up going to business school and was inspired in business school around entrepreneurship and technology. Came out and started uh, my first internet company in 1999 called military.com which is sort of like um, Facebook social network for the military. It's still around. And in uh, through some trials and tribulations we can talk about. In, in 1996 I started Affinity Labs um, I sold both of them to Monster, and in 19, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 2006, started Affinity Labs. In 2008, I sold it, um, and then decided what I really wanted to do was travel and tell stories and be a photographer, and that's what I've been doing since. Yes, I, I, I run a little investment firm called Nautilus Ventures, but I am by no means a great venture capitalist. I am really a entrepreneur that's made a lot of mistakes that tries to help people where I can, and and try to tell their stories because um, I find them very interesting. So three careers, uh, moderate success or passable success in all three, and we'll see what's next. 
what was the compelling event? How does a Navy officer end up as an entrepreneur? Was it the courses and the classes? Was it an individual that influenced you along the way? An exciting technology or business opportunity? Uh, perhaps um, well, talk about military.com experience. Yeah, well, uh, that's a great question. You know, and I, this is you know when I when I get to chat to talk on entrepreneurship, one of the things I I'm compelled to share with people is kind of maybe the opportunity for inspiration to change our lives. And sometimes that inspiration happens in very kind of unpredictable ways. And uh, you know, maybe somebody's listening, maybe they can hear something that will make a difference. And this is, this is what's so exciting about teaching. Teachers really have this opportunity. So the serendipitous event was basically, I was gonna go to the Kennedy School to get a, a master's in public administration. And I ran into a Navy guy who had gone to Harvard Business School and he said, really, you should go to the business school because you know you can do whatever you want. It's kind of a good background. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know I can get in, but if this Navy guy could get in, maybe I could get in. And you know, I was lucky enough uh, to be part of their diversity admit program. And showed up at school not knowing about business, and you know, I really got schooled. You know, I had done pretty well in the Navy, and I remember sitting there in the classroom for the first day next to all these Goldman Sachs people and McKinsey people and you know never having had a business school class in my life and it was a scary moment uh, maybe as scary as you know being at the end of the Gulf War um, and uh, I took a class on entrepreneurship and um, one day they brought this entrepreneur came in named Dan Bricklin do you, do you guys know Dan oh yeah sure okay great yeah of course do you, do you remember what do you remember what Dan is known for um. Uh, this is age, you know, uh, Dan. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you right. a physical, of course. Yeah. Yes, physical, exactly. Yeah, of course. So, so this, so imagine you're a student at Harvard Business School in 1997, and I should say, um, I was always a tech nerd. So I was programming computers in 1979. I loved technology, uh, but didn't think of myself as a business person. So you know, the the world has changed a little bit. Everyone's an entrepreneur. If you code, you know, you automatically think, well, I I can create a company. In 1996, uh, this is this is not the way, and it's not as pervasive. And this guy Dan Bricklin, who doesn't look like other people that visit the Harvard Business School, uh, he has a beard and he has a, a flannel shirt. Maybe he looks like entrepreneurs in San Francisco today, but again, he was quite different. And he talked about creating this company, and I created it when he was at the business school because he didn't like the way they were doing accounting. And he talked about starting the company and how important it was and you, you know you Soft, both realize software arts okay okay it's the company okay i always thought it was visicorp but maybe oh, it was Vi Corp. Uh, oh maybe it was sorry sorry i'm sorry well Go I, on. you know you may you may know better but you know when you bought a computer in 1980 you know the the three apps or 1981 the three killer apps on the pc were you know visicalc uh, probably wordstar i think it was wordstar and the adventure game so you know he built the, a piece of software that was the excuse for people to buy a computer, and he talked about his trials and tribulations. And as we know, um, Lotus One Two Three and Mitch Kapoor put him out of business. And you know if you ask young people today, they'll say, "Oh, it was Microsoft and Excel," and you know it wasn't a great outcome for him. But he talked about how important it was in his life, and how as he reflected on his life, having built something that mattered was the most important thing. And to be respected and feel like you did something of import was the most important thing. And boy, really, um, it resonated with me. And I, I knew right then that what I really, really wanted to do was start a company. But you know, that's a that's good news and bad news because once you decide that that's what you want, well, then what do you do? I want to be an entrepreneur, but where do you get the idea? And uh, that's where I was in a state of high anxiety at Harvard Business School in 1997, trying to figure out what it is I was going to go do. And so how did you come up with the idea for military.com? Well, I uh, helped start a biotech company when I was at business school at the tech transfer office and it failed. And I only had one job offer with Mercer Management Consulting in San Francisco. So I came out to San Francisco and worked in strategy consulting. And I was real, I mean, I learned a lot and you know, I, I, I can commend it to people, but I was really unhappy. There was a lot going on. I mean, in a way, 1998 was a little like today in terms of buzz and excitement and venture capital and I wanted to start a company and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where the idea would come from. I was also in the reserve so I was drilling you know one weekend a month, two weeks a year, although during the war more than that, um, in my squadron and you know I remember vividly 
in the summer of 1999 going to a ward a wardroom meeting and this is where the officers are sitting there and people are doing what sailors do they are bitching about getting access to their benefits and they're also asking me if I know a lot of people from other squadrons so it's like sort of like two people who went to the same college who said oh did you know Val or did you know you know Michael or did you know Bob they were doing this around the Navy and you know in the Navy is small enough that you might actually know people so two things one was they were trying to connect with each other in a kind of offline way and there was a kind of lack of transparency around government benefits and there's 24 million people in the military community so literally and you know you hear this but this is really true um, it was a you know it hit me like a ton of bricks that the internet was the perfect vehicle to connect enable and empower the military and so I left that meeting knowing that I was going to start this company and wow. basically quit my consulting job, you know, a few weeks later, uh, still owing, you know, $100,000 to Harvard. And I started on my entrepreneurial journey. That's amazing. That's amazing. Has there been a common thread in terms of the companies that you founded in terms of connecting people? Has it always been a, something that inspired you to, to jump from one project to another? Uh, that's an interesting question. Well, we can talk a lot more about you know what I learned at military.com, but um, I, as I said, I love technology and I was using kind of proto social networks in 1996, 1997. I was really fascinated, really interesting stuff. And um, you know, in building military.com, it was really well. It was a very difficult experience. I got fired. I learned a lot. I you know um, it was a transformational experience. But we figured out some things through some difficulties. And then when we sold the company to Monster, it was doing well. And so basically we had this community where we could bring people together. I mean, remember, this is pre the term social network, pre um, this is pre-Facebook. And it worked. And we thought, you know, I was thinking to myself, well, if it works for the military, I remember Monster's got, you know, Monster at the time is quite a big company, and they're the jobs company. And you know, part of what we did was help people transition out of the military and get jobs. Um, that wasn't the only thing that we did. We helped them join the military, relocate, use their educational benefits, find each other, read news. It was like a, it was like kind of like Yahoo meets Facebook for the military, and it worked. And I thought, well, we should do this for nurses and teachers and police officers and government workers and skiers. And I thought, well, think about the monster database with everyone's resume. There's all these like de facto professional networks that are in the data. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. if you're a CMO, that's a community of people. You know, CXO is a community of people. And I thought, what we could do is build a platform to go do that for all of these different communities, right? A thousand Facebooks. Mm -hmm. And um, so I talked to Monster about it. I said, well, we should do this. And uh, they didn't want to do it. So um, it was a little more complicated a story. And uh, so I left and did it on my own, um, basically using the lessons from military.com. So in a way, you could say Affinity Labs, my second startup, which did well we actually built like six professional communities um, each with their own URL each like military.com and we sold the company after I did that but the idea was that we would do hundreds of them so I guess there was a common thread some of that common thread was passion but some of that common thread was we figured out a model that worked and I felt mm -hmm. the model could be replicated so you uh, you started a couple of companies and sold them and you've invested in a lot of companies what are some of the uh, the primary success characteristics or the obstacles because it's really two sides of the same coin for startups and for entrepreneurs that you've observed in your experience hmm that's an interesting question well <clears throat> you know I, I I would say that you know when almost my entire view of this was informed by um, a very personal and difficult set of experiences as the CEO of military.com. So I can tell you about those because I think it does inform um, the lens in which I see companies. Um, you know, but uh, there is a difference between a successful investment outcome and a successful company, right? Do you, do you guys see that? And, and like the successful investment outcome is, you know, I, I put money into a company and the company somehow has an exit and returns more capital than I invested, right? And a lot of companies today sell early and they sell before they've had to build an entire infrastructure on sales until they've, they've sold on promise. So, you know, I don't know if I have a view on that other than 
it's difficult to say with a lot of these companies, there's a lot of happenstance. A lot of these product-oriented businesses are really little products. They're little product teams. Are they real companies? Sort of, sort of not. Um, eventually, you know, if Instagram had stayed private, they would have to figure out their business. They would have had to have delivered a real revenue model. I mean, I think they could have done it, but the challenges they would face would have been very different than the challenges they faced in creating an incredibly compelling product that was used by a lot of people that, you know, eventually Facebook wanted to buy. So I would say I would differentiate um, smaller companies that are really operating on promise that aren't revenue, aren't so focused on revenue, and then companies that are really having to do the heavy lifting every day, deliver the quarterly revenue, deal with large people on the team. You know, that so two different sets of kind of observations, two different sets of outcomes. So um, I can talk about those or um, I can share with you the military.com sob story, redemption story. <laughs> so if I'm, if I'm looking to start a company, can you give me some advice? I mean, what are the, some of the things I should avoid? How do you build a, a strong team? You said some of these companies have little products and they're not quite companies, but they're building around a potential. Any life lessons that you could boil down in something that I can tweet as well? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, a well, big question, narrowing it down to something... Uh, you know, you know, a, a precise life lesson. You know, it's funny because uh, we were just before we came on air, we were kind of talking about as as we've gained more knowledge and experience in life, um, we well, at least I'm believing that I know less and less. Absolutely. So, um, and you know, this is a quite a disturbing trend. You know, you think after I mean, I feel like the pinnacle of my knowledge and confidence in my knowledge was the day I graduated from Harvard Business School where I felt I knew everything. And uh, it's just been going really downhill from, from there. And I, I don't know where this ends, but it's not probably good. So I think I won't be able to give anyone any advice uh, soon because I, I feel like um, there, there are a lot of nuances. But I, I do think that there are some synthesized truths. So um, I have one piece of advice. It's going to sound very, very obvious to you, but it is the single most important um, well, I'm going to even quote it for you. It's the most important quote I've ever heard in my entire life. Wow. And I think wow. we, if someone does this as an entrepreneur or potential entrepreneur, they have completely changed the odds, completely changed the odds in their favor. You ready? Yes, tell us. Okay. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. is killing me. <laughs> you know why? Because uh, if I keep it to myself, then I can be the guy. <laughs> there we go. You know, you can, so you can I, I'm, only gonna share with, I'm only going to share with companies that let me invest in their company. But it's incredible. If you knew <laughs> okay. it, we'll no, cover I'm, our ears. <laughs> no, okay. no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually, obviously, just kidding. Um, it, I'm, I've, I've, I've built it up too much. It's, it's a quote by John Burroughs, and he says, uh, "Leap in the net will appear. Leap in the net will appear." And this is everything to me. The difference between, you know. Everyone in the world and, and a lot of these well-known entrepreneurs is they just took some risk. Um, people that are really smart, really thoughtful, that understand the deep complexity of companies oftentimes are paralyzed with analysis. You know, this is the stay hungry and stay foolish misattribution to Steve Jobs, right? Wasn't it Stuart Brand, um, the whole Earth catalog? Stay hungry and stay foolish. Very difficult to do. But... I almost don't care. When I meet a great entrepreneur, I almost don't care what the idea is exactly. Um, I mean, yes, if they're going to do something that's super difficult and they don't have a lot of capital and won't be easy to raise capital, well, that might give us a little bit of pause. Um, but if they're working on a pretty good idea, just go do it. Just go say, I am going to go do this company. And I mean, you have to believe. I mean, I think inauthentic leaping isn't so good, where you say, I just want to be an entrepreneur and you know, that's, I'm just going to be an entrepreneur. It's okay. I mean, it can work. But we'd rather one where you have a passion around some idea or something that you think needs to be fixed. You're authentic about it, and then just go do it. But, and, you know, it'll work itself out. But what do you, can you elaborate on what do you mean by authentic? It's a, it's a really interesting question because from the point of view of the person who wants to do this, it's, it, it's genuine interest in every case, but when you say authentic, it, it, there are other characteristics, right? Like they understand the market, 
that they have some capability. What is so? Can you elaborate on that? Well, is, I, maybe I was getting maybe I was getting at a kind of very specific point. When I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, they really believe in their idea, right? Um, you know, what do they say? There's that great quote: um, "Some things need to be believed to be seen." Right, not seen to be believed, but believed to be seen. And when I meet an entrepreneur that really believes something, right, that's what I mean by authenticity. Sometimes I meet people that are raising money, and you know, we have a cult of entrepreneurship now, which I think is mostly good, but we have a lot of people in the field now, and so many people want to be entrepreneurs. I don't know if they as you know, if as many of them believe in their idea as maybe they did five years ago or six years ago. Right? They really believe in the idea of being an entrepreneur, and they know that they need, to be, they need to pretend to believe in their idea. But do they truly believe in it? Because this is a very important characteristic. It's not required, but it's very important because if things get difficult and they get challenged in a really fundamental way, do they have the chutzpah, the belief, the passion to take it all the way, to give it everything? You know? And... Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you see that distinction. So some people seem to like their idea, but you're not sure whether they even fully believe it. And some people, you know, believe it more than anything else. And well, the latter is the most authentic and the one I like the most. And it's a characteristic of entrepreneur that I just adore. Do you have to do you have to see uh, and feel um, the focus and and sense of urgency in order to call it authentic? I mean, can you be authentic if you lack focus and urgency uh, when you're trying to, you know, start a company, as an example? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I hate to generalize. I mean, all of these are generalizations. So, sure. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's lots of people that have lots of different characteristics. So um, I think you can be authentic and not work hard. You know, I think it's possible. Um, there's, a, there's a portfolio of characteristics that seem to work really well. You know, it's integrity, it's caring of people, caring for people, it's passion, it's some smarts, and you know, and the other one that's really important is tenacity, right? Um, you know, if we had a, an hour and a half, I could tell you over and over and over again, um, I was faced with challenges where very smart people, including board members, told me to stop working on the company. One of them, I remember, um, uh, General Carl Mundy, who was the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who was an advisor to my company. So Commandant of the Marine Corps is the CEO of the Marine Corps. So this guy's an important four-star general. And he said to me during the nadir of military.com, you know, he said, sometimes you need to know when to give up on the battlefield. And did you ignore his advice? <laughs> I almost I almost didn't. You know, uh, the board told me this looks like a nonprofit. You know, I got fired. I came back when the company had like six people in it, and we were basically talking to bankruptcy lawyers, and I didn't give up. And this happened, in, I mean, this exact thing didn't happen like this, but we had a number of cases in, in other companies where things got very difficult, and now I see the power of that moment. I see the power of what happens during that sort of diamond creation process with incredible pressure. And, you know, we were talking earlier about Real innovation. A lot of real innovation happens through these difficult processes. And this is why a lot of big companies can't really do the most difficult kinds of innovation because it requires a kind of superhuman effort and a kind of personal sacrifice um, that only happens when entrepreneurs feel that this is almost the most important thing to them. You know, at military.com, I, I didn't have an alternative. If I didn't make the company work, I wasn't hireable. I owed people a lot of money. I I remember asking my co-founder if I could live on her couch or sleep on her couch because I worried that I didn't have enough money to survive. And you know, so the alternative to me to to making the company work was a kind of death. Um, and that's a powerful forcing function. Sure. It's a, I'm not saying you need it today. I'm not saying you need that, but I, but if you don't have a lot of tenacity, you will you will not go that far, and you will potentially miss the opportunities to do some really great things. Well, there has to be some something that's motivating you, either intense motivating one to do that, either intense personal drive, or not wanting to have to sleep forever on your co-founder's couch or whatever it might be. It has to be something. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I, I had, I mean, we all suffer from ego challenges and <laughs> and insecurity. And you know, it's a very interesting. I find insecurity incredibly fascinating thing. And even you know, as we all know, some of the most accomplished people are incredibly insecure, and it's a kind of driver for them, and it's a powerful driver. And we don't like that characteristic, but again, it's a powerful driver. And my insecurity was I was a Navy guy that never went to, you know, never had a business class and was always the outsider. I moved eight times as a kid. I felt like I was an admissions mistake at Harvard. When I was doing my first startup, I was an outsider, a military guy. I had something to prove in a big way. And, you know, that, that helped me. Uh, it hurt. I mean, you pay for it, but it helped me. Um, so what are people's drivers? I mean, you know, there's another driver. Uh, one advantage to raising capital from people is you make a commitment to others that you're going to deliver for them. You hire a team. You have a commitment to the team. So there are things that can force us to leap. I always tell my friends who are successful, I said, well, if you really want to make it happen, just go raise $6 million in your A round, right? And all of a sudden you have a board of directors, which is like your your coach that is waiting for you to deliver. And next thing you know, you've, you're treading water. you got to swim. you got to make it to shore. So... Uh so you've written a lot about, and you've spoken about activities versus outcomes. And so maybe sort of link that in. And I'm just looking at the time, so maybe just for a few minutes, because uh, as people watching probably know, you're this great uh, photographer, and we have a slideshow set up where you're going to talk us through some of your photos. And I want to be sure that we have plenty of time for that. So well, activi you... activities versus outcomes. Right. So what, you know, there were... Uh... The, the military.com talk, when I talk about the nadir of that experience of having been fired, you know, I had about four months or three months as the fired CEO. And just to, to put a, a fine point on it, um, when they hired the new CEO, he sat in my office in my chair as I came in and sat in the guest chair, you know, my office with all my things. And he said, you know, it's probably best that you don't come by the company anymore. And uh, just think about what that might be like, right? Not, yeah. not a positive feeling. And so I went swimming. So there was a, a swimming pool at the gym, and I swam every day, and I really thought about what the mistakes were in the company, and there were a variety of mistakes, leadership mistakes around the characteristic of great companies that I didn't follow, like is everyone in the company an A player? Were we getting rid of people that weren't performing, that were either nice uh, but not great, or maybe great, but not good people, not good fit in the company, because that, you know, that really doesn't contribute to an incredible corporate culture. And one of the things I really believe in so deeply is um, how possible it is for CEOs to build incredible cultures, how there is a, an approach. And if you build that kind of culture, and I feel like we we did that in second half of military.com and at Affinity Labs, you can do anything. You've built a machine that can do anything. You've built a special forces team that can solve any problem, break through any wall, and I love that. It's one of my most favorite things in the world. One of the other mistakes that we made is, you know, we raised $30 million or $25 million, and um, we were doing a lot of things in the company that looked like they were good ideas and they were good activities, but they did not lead to outcomes. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is there's a whole lot of things that we can do that seem like a good idea that you know, we engage in, but can you tie it actually to an outcome for the company? Can you tie it to revenue? Can you tie it to users? Can you tie it to business success? And when you raise a lot of capital and there is no forcing function, um, there is a lot of danger. And, you know, since I've uh, talked a lot about this, there's been a lot of movements here, the lean movement. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of companies are doing a lot with the seed, with seed rounds, so they don't have a lot of capital. That's a good forcing function for people. But I also see a lot of companies that raise a lot of money, or big companies, or or think about like the government. Think about how much money we spend on education or defense. You know, the challenges we have in these areas are not related to the amount of capital we're spending. We're just doing a lot of things that may not matter. And having the discipline to see the difference between activities. Now, because I'll give you an example. Um, I was spending twenty thousand dollars a month for, with our PR firm. So let me ask you guys. Um, the PR firm comes to us and says, "I've got a front page Business Week story for you." Is that an activity or an outcome for my company? Activity. Uh, it's 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 a tough it's a tough call because a front page story in Business Week is uh, pretty significant from a marketing standpoint. Well, okay. So what I'm going to say is it it seems like it's a pretty good thing, right? But it isn't directly an outcome. 
right? Lots of press is indirectly an outcome. That press has to lead to something. Mm -hmm. The press has to lead to sales. It has to lead to revenue. It has to lead to hiring. It has to lead to something. So it's a process. And, it's a process item. Well, it's really, um, yes, it's a process item, but it's really that someone in the company is asking the tough questions around, are these things that we're doing making a difference? Is bringing in this great web consultant making a difference? Is building this piece of content making a difference? Is this feature making a difference? Uh, look, it's easy to, to point to the things that like don't seem like good things. It is really hard to triangulate on those few things, those few levers that really make a difference. Like think about your own show. You could do lots. Of, you could have lots of people on the show. You could do lots of tweaks. But you know there might be a few things that if you did them right. They really move the needle. Sure. So um, I didn't do that right, and I probably wasted. You know, we did a lot of advertising. I probably wasted 15 million of the 22 million. And um, you know, I'm very, very focused on helping the companies that I work with um, not make those mistakes again. And you know, I think about it even in my life and what I observe in the world. And a lot of people struggle with this. A lot of people get confused. But but to be fair, did you did you didn't have the technology to measure outcomes or desired results, did you? I mean, I, on, without marketing automation, CRM, influence reporting, predictive analytics, I mean, how did you how do you measure outcome 15 years ago in marketing? Yeah, well, you know, we were one of the early companies to to do online lead generation. So what one of the evolutions of Military.com is we got very good at figuring out how to spend marketing dollars that were profitable in the company. Awesome. So we were able to tie. I mean, you know, we, we had data scientists and we were tying marketing work with driving registrations or leads on the website. Um, but I think the, the, the danger here is even without, I mean, yes, if you have those analytical tools, it's a lot better. But there's still a lot of things that you could be doing that seem like a good idea, but we don't, we don't think we can measure them. And, you know, I just think we should be very cautious about those activities in our lives. Um, a lot of, I mean, when I was at Monster, they were hiring the biggest ad agencies in the world doing Super Bowl ads. One of those Super Bowl ads helped Monster a lot, and the rest of them wasted almost a billion dollars of value, I think. So, and you know, the ad agencies are going to tell you a lot of things about how their predictive analytics and their audience measurement are really helpful to you. And now I look at that with incredible skepticism, right? And I think, frankly, CMOs and CEOs need to be looking with incredible skepticism at a lot of these things because they don't move the needle for them. Well, there's no doubt that for many startups there's a strong element of ego that's involved and you can make the and and I'm sure many startups make the argument, "Oh, these huge fancy parties are important Absolutely. to spread the word." But let's face it, these huge, huge fancy parties are a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun to spend money, especially something well, else. Well, you know, I took, I'm so glad you brought that up because you reminded me I have a story. So I, um, when we launched Military.com, I remember I had these very famous board members. It was my first time as a CEO. And uh, do you guys know about the launch party at Military.com? You ever heard about it? No. It's a, kind of a famous thing. Maybe it's famous in the olden days. We rented an aircraft carrier. We rented an aircraft carrier and shipped people by boat out to the aircraft carrier. And the guest speaker was one of our advisors, Stephen Ambrose, who wrote D-Day and Undaunted Courage and Citizen Soldier. And there was a view that this would be helpful in our brand, it would be a big splash, and there was a USA Today story, and there was a lot of these things. Gentlemen, this was a waste of money. It was a great memory, so I, you know, I got that. That was an outcome. It was really something I'll never forget. But you know, we see this in, in companies. I go and visit all these startups now. They have incredible office spaces, and they you know, provide all these perks to people. And um, you know, they think it's making a difference in the company. Is it? You know, I actually think that we get confused in Silicon Valley around the things that really matter to employees, right? We think it's comp, or we think it's, you know, some sort of equity package or some earnout, or we think it might be what this office space looks like. Those things are important for sure, but they really keep us from the real drivers of human behavior. And I know, and the reason I know about this is I was in the military. In the military, there is no special pay package for extra performance. You know, you don't get a bonus. I saw people that were very good, work very hard, and do their very, very best because what they really wanted to do was the right thing. They wanted to be acknowledged for it. They wanted to feel proud of what they were doing, right? This whole pay compensation schema that we think is driving a lot of behaviors is a false um, area of optimization. The primary driver is really good leadership. It's really inspiration. 
it's really making people feel valued that this is a good use of their time, they're proud of the work, they're learning. You know, those are the things that we should be working on. Those are, I think, the biggest levers. A lot of people will work for almost nothing if they feel like what they're doing is important. Uh, Chris, we have a question from Twitter from Christopher Kelly, who asks, what Do I is... know this Christopher Kelly? <laughs> uh, okay. Chris... I know Chris Kelly. Oh, you do? Okay. And Chris yeah, Kelly... I know Chris Kelly. Uh, okay. Well, this Chris Kelly uh, is asking, what is an A player to you? And I'll ask you to answer very briefly because we're, we're just going to run out of time. So very briefly, okay. what is an A player to you? Well, to me, uh, you know, in my quadrant, which is, you know, fit, uh, high to low, and competence, high to low, there's somebody that is contributing to the culture of the company, that's somebody that we can work with, that we care and we trust, that's passionate about their job, and they're good at their job. So to me, it's a, you know, you're in the quadrant of, um, you know, very good, very technically competent at your job, and you're a good fit um, in the company. And, you know, ide- you know, it depends on what level you're at in the company, but ideally a leader. Competence, confidence, and character. Yeah. yeah. But I, I really, you know, a whole other show could just be on all the challenges we have with these people that are um, incredibly good at their job but are a problem for the company. And there's just, you know, there's in many cases a lack of confidence in dealing with them because we're afraid of losing these people. And it's really hurting um, execution in a lot of companies. Well, when, when one looks at your photographs, one of the things that really comes through, especially your photographs of people, is empathy. And so maybe can you connect this notion of empathy to, being, to, to running a successful company? Um, well, I would say you know, if I were to um, triangulate on one thing that led to my failure as the CEO, um, at military.com in, the, in you know, 2001 when I got fired is that I didn't build sufficient trust and connection with my team. And um, this is a problem. You know, I would say you could skip your MBA. You know, I recommend this book called The Thin Book of Trust. It's really short. And it's a really incredible book. It takes you like 20 minutes to read it. But if you can build trust with people and connect with them, um, people will do almost anything with you for you. You can give them direct feedback, you can push hard, you can ask a lot of them, and if they trust you, you can have a great dialogue, but if they do not trust you, you have a major problem. And, you know, I learned those lessons, um, and I saw what was possible. I mean, and, you know, I would say the source of lack of trust to some extent was we had a bad business environment, but it was really that I was a first-time CEO and sufficiently insecure that I felt like I needed to bully people or I needed to show them that I was smarter and I was not vulnerable. And, you know, boy, what a giant mistake. So the overcompensation of my own insecurity led to huge trust issues. And, you know, were those trust issues that much greater than other companies? You know, it wasn't incredibly bad, but it was... But where I was really missing was how much better it could have been. So I've really you know, over the last 15 years, really just grown to love people and love working with them and and appreciating their lives and what they're going through. And, you know, once you build that kind of environment, um, my relationship with my employees and my company is a lifetime relationship. You know, I even tell them, one day you're going to lose passion about the company and I'm going to help you get another job. Uh, You know, this isn't a one-off transaction. So, um, I don't know, I I feel that way when I take pictures of photographs, or when I take pictures of people as well. I feel a real connection to people. It may be an artifact of just getting older and knowing more people, Um, but to me they seem not unrelated, so. It's incredibly inspiring. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think, any of us who have the fortunate to be in leadership roles have to view it as a privilege and Constantly work the crap. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking about a Simon Sinek TED talk where he says we all know what we do. Some of us know how we do it, but often we don't know or don't communicate why we do what we do. Yeah. And right. as leaders, to establish those connections and trust, we need to really burn some calories explaining why we do what we do and and involve and, and employees. And so. Your, uh, your commentary certainly resonates with me. I appreciate it. Well, that. we've all had bosses where we just didn't trust them, right? Yeah. We just didn't know if they cared about us. Sure. 
you know, it's that's not a good position to be in. I mean, it's not related just to work. It's related to everyone in our lives. And, right. um, you know, it's suboptimal performance if you don't trust people, and it's incredible performance if you, if you can build a culture of trust. And I think, to be honest with you, the first step is to be vulnerable and to talk to people. You know, and I remember in my um, last company, my latest company, Affinity Labs, you know, we built such a cool culture that even junior people felt that they had both the right and obligation to give me feedback as the CEO about stuff I wasn't doing right. right. It's kind of cool. Like, you, you know, you could look at it and say, well, I don't like that because it reduces my power in the company. But if you're, you, you almost create a kind of invulnerability if you're, like, okay with it and you appreciate it. And you even look at it intellectually and depersonalize it, you know. Um, we're kind of all in it together. So, you know, does it work in a company of 5,000 people? I don't really know. I haven't run a company like that. It certainly works in a, in a company with hundreds of people. And it's the big opportunity because you can really get to know those people, and it could be a really cool experience. Well, without a doubt, we could continue talking about this. It's, it's such an important topic, and trust is the foundation for anything that involves... Uh, the successful outcome of people working together. But if you can see, do you see uh, my screen with the photograph right now? Okay. Ah, yes. My, uh, my space, space suit selfie. So let's take a look at some of your photos. Um, and I'm hoping everybody can, you see, you, Vala, can you see, uh, you see the photo on my screen? Is it? Absolutely, absolutely. So, okay. How did well, you end up? What's, what, what's where, going on here? You tell yeah. me. What do you think's going on here? It's like, okay, so it's a selfie, but obviously you're not holding the camera, and right. you don't have a selfie stick. Okay. okay. It's a go. It's a GoPro that I've just turned on to take the photo, and in fact, I don't know that I'm actually taking a selfie. What I'm doing really is, I'm monkeying with a camera that's auto taking photos. And uh, it, you know, it just looks like a cool selfie photo. But I'm, I'm basically, uh, well, let me. Uh, here's my humble brag. I, you know, I was incredibly fortunate to fly to the edge of space with the United States Air Force. So, in this photo, I'm the eleventh highest person in the world, which is probably uh, the coolest thing that I will ever do in my life. And I'm in the back seat above the pilot of a U-2 spy plane at about seventy-two thousand feet. Wow. You know, it was a. Experience. I, I'm not sure, Vala. What can we say? Uh, nothing. You just, that that that's quite a humble brag. <laughs> that, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that yeah. totally works as a humble brag. Yeah, I, there's there's nothing that you and I are are planning to do or I've done in the past that I can think of that uh that uh that quite matches that uh, what must have been an incredibly exhilarating, humbling. Wow, it's a big world experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I could see the Earth curved. Well, th there's only one downside of having this experience, and maybe it's like going on a date with Scarlett Johansson, uh, where you don't get a second date. You're like, well, that might have been as good as it gets. So when I landed, and they handed me a bottle of champagne, and the, and the general saluted, and I took my spacesuit off. I said, "This is the best moment of my life, and it's about to end." But at least I can uh, look at the photo and remember. How did you? How did how did it happen? How did you make it happen? Um, I uh, I gave a talk to a bunch of generals um, at Davis Monfan Air Force Base about leadership and innovation in the military, and they also knew I took photographs. And this guy comes up to me afterwards, this colonel, and he said, "If you come to my base, I will uh, and give a talk. I will fly you in the U-2." And I'm like, "What did you just say?" Uh, I didn't even know the U-2 was still flying, which they are. And so it was a quid pro quo. I did an article for um, some uh, a magazine, and I um, did some photographs, and I gave a talk, and that was the experience. Well, I'm afraid that f we appreciate your being on CXO Talk today, but we can't offer. That ain't going to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. You never know. That's we're right. in trouble. I know exactly. Uh, okay, so. So tell us what are what are we looking at here? So um, I um, I occasionally work with a company called Backroads, and if you don't know them, they're a, a cool company to know. They do active travel trips and um, biking, hiking all over the world, and they're not that expensive. You can go anywhere. And I've been on some really really amazing trips with them, 
and I have a nice deal where they let me go on the trip for free if I take some pictures for them. And um, I, I was out on this mountainside just hiking along in Peru, and there's this this woman, I guess she's a villager, and she's just walking by me and she's just picking up um, you know, flowers and just having a kind of moment, and I and I love this photograph. She's not engaged with me. She's just having, you know, a moment outside, and uh, she seems so happy and so connected to nature and so real. Um, it just makes me smile every time I see this photo. It's a lovely photo. Yeah, thank you. It's all her. Uh, so who who is this? Well, this is obviously the Dalai Lama. Okay, well done. Wow. So um, I had a, I've had a couple cool photo assignments, and one of the cool photo assignments was um, that I knew this monk. He runs the MIT Center um, uh, for Dalai Lama. For the, I'm sorry, the MIT Ethics Center at the Dalai Lama Center at MIT. And he's friends with the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama was coming. And he said, "Would you be the Dalai Lama's photographer?" And so for three days, I was the so you know. I, I was the photographer. So I was, you know, a few feet from him in his hotel room. Traveled around, went around with the security people, and um, you know, I'm kind of a Buddhist, and I say kind of because there's lots of things I'm sure I could be doing that I'm not doing. Um, but I, you know, when you get to spend time with the Dalai Lama, who's somebody I've always respected, you know, you don't know what you're really going to find when you get behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Is he really the person we think he is? Is he really kind and compassionate even when the doors are shut? And I can tell you, he really is. He is wow. better and more authentic and more loving and more funny and more scientific uh, than I had even imagined. And I saw, I mean, when you're around somebody that many hours a day, all day long, and this just gives you a little sense of his kind of, you know, his, his energy, just smiling and happy and engaged, and it was a really cool experience. Lucky you. Yeah, lucky me. I was just thinking about that. Wow, when you know, I don't know, I don't know what to say. When, when you give, the world gives back. Boy, you uh, you uh, have had an extraordinary life. This is pretty amazing stuff. I feel really lucky. I feel really lucky. Yeah. Um, okay, what, what's going on here? Anybody know? Uh, I was thinking Burning Man, but no, because this is either in China, Tibet, it's Tibet has to be Tibet. It is Tibet, isn't it? Or Nepal, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, you know what's so funny? You know, you asked me to send you a collection of photographs, and um, I just looked quickly at like my gallery and pulled out a bunch of photos. It is incredibly ironic that um, we had a picture of the Dalai Lama and then this photograph. And I didn't mean it. I just now just noticed why it's really ironic. This is uh, Lhasa, Tibet. This is the tradition. This is where the Dalai Lama ruled. This was his palace, right? Um, and he fled from the Chinese from this palace when he was a boy to Dharmasala, India. He hasn't returned. The Chinese won't allow him, you know. And there's a huge problem in China. And all of these people are Buddhists, and they're all doing morning kora around the temple right near, um, uh, right near Potala Palace. Potala where he Palace. Lived. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't Potala Palace. It's right nearby. It's just behind mm -hmm. us. And we're doing morning kora, so they're, they're going around the temple in a clockwise way, and this is incense that's burning, right, and these are all Buddhists, except is you, if you can look into the center of the screen, you see a man with a military hat. Do you see that with his arm out, outstretched? Yes. Center of, yeah, that's a Chinese soldier kind of being aggressive with the people. And um, really a, a very, I mean, interesting juxtaposition of these two photos. Well, I, um, fig I figured it was... Uh, Tibet, because on the left-hand side I saw the Chinese uh, characters, and then uh, in the top, in the center, I could see it looks like uh, a stupa or a de or you know uh, Tibetan prayer flag. So I figure, okay, yes. had to be. You got it. That's it. So this is sunrise in Chinese-occupied Tibet. Okay. And uh, uh, this photo, this photo hangs in the Battery Club in San Francisco. Um, it's uh, it's a train station in rural Myanmar, and uh, there's nothing special. I mean, there's nothing special about the story other than um, the investor Mike Leventhal, who uh, 
told me that maybe we should find a new CEO. He was my lead investor for Mayfield at, um, at military.com. Although we had gone through that difficult experience, we've become friends, and we went together um, through Myanmar. And this is uh, kind of, the sun is kind of setting, and it was really, I just knew that we should stop and spend some time taking photos of all of these people interacting with the train. You know, they're, they're putting their head through the window, the light is amazing. It's a very kind of personal experience. And uh, right behind me is the guy who uh, terminated me from my first company. So uh, you can come full circle uh, mm -hmm. and you can uh, end up loving these people that can cause you some, some trauma earlier. Uh, Mike's an incredible guy and, you know, I owe a lot to him. Uh, you know, I just want to tell everybody who's watching, we're just running a little bit late. We're going to run over today, so... So I hope you'll stay and continue watching. And so these look like either Tibet or Nepal, or you. I saw photos from Bhutan, so maybe Bhutan. Yep. So it's a um, it's a little monastery, and these are um, kind of young monks, and we call them monklets. And um, you know, I'm just wandering up the stairs in this monastery, and I see these three boys, and they're not like they're just, they're just sitting in the corner, and I said, uh, you know. I, I have my camera out, and I kind of point at my camera. I mostly ask people before I take their photo. And this is what they do. They immediately go into some, I'm not cool enough to know what any of these pose, the, are the gang symbols, hipsters, I don't know what they're doing. But I found it quite ironic in rural Bhutan, where there were no, I mean, there weren't <laughs> any tourists around, that this is, this is how they wanted to pose for me. So it was kind of a fun moment. Uh, this is His Holiness. It's a wonderful photo. Thank you. Look how happy he is. Yeah. He's happy all the time. I mean, you know, I I have a long day of meeting entrepreneurs every hour, and I, I at the end of the day, I'm kind of grumpy. I can't have any more coffee. This guy meets, you know, a million times more people than me, and he's been doing it for 70 years. And it, with each person, he's happy and engaged and never tired. And, you know, whatever potion he's using, I, I want some of it. <laughs> um, you know, this is kind of a quirky photo that I, I threw in here. This is um, right near the St. Francis Yacht Club, right by the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, this guy doesn't know I'm taking his photo. Um, I just see a guy with a cowboy hat, and I had this idea that it, it just seemed like this photo kind of represented our manifest destiny, you know, the, the cowboy that came west. And this is about you know, as far as you can go, so, um, with the Golden Gate Bridge, I, I kind of like the picture. Um, oh, this is my favorite sunrise picture. Anybody know where this is? No? Uh, Canadian Rockies? No. No? Okay. It's, uh, it's in Patagonia, it's southern Patagonia, a place called Torres del Paine National Park in Chile, and, um, what you can't see behind me, you know, there should be a, a, a show on, like, what's actually going on in the shot. So what's behind me is a really cool hotel, and um, this is, I don't know, 4.30 in the morning. And every day um, I would get up at, like, you know, 2.30 or 3.30 because the sun doesn't the sun doesn't stay down very long because we're really in a southern latitude. And I would try to take pictures of the sun, the sunrise, um, by these mountains, and every single day it was terrible. I couldn't see anything. It was like one of those sunrises where you're like, did the sun rise? I can't even tell. Cloudy, whatever. And the last day, and you know, it's really a pain in the neck to get up this early every day when you're going to bed at like midnight after processing photos. And maybe this photo is sort of representative of the tenacity of entrepreneurship. And my last day, I almost didn't get up, and I decided to get up, and I went out there, and I waited for 40 minutes, and we got, um, or I got this, what I think is an incredible picture of a really spectacular sunrise. So sometimes... Uh, you keep throwing yourself against the wall, and it, and occasionally it breaks down. So, do you carry a tripod with you, or is this handheld? Um, this is not handheld, but what it is is the camera. You know, when we talk about a tripod, what you really are saying is, do you use any kind of stability system? Mm -hmm. And the stability system I mostly use is I put my camera on the ground. So this camera is probably sitting, you know, on the ground with my jacket underneath of it, and I've got a t like a two second timer. And I push the two-second timer, I let go of the camera, and I let it shoot. So that's what's going on. How do you uh, – so that means you're down on your 
belly looking through the viewfinder on what could be very cold ground. Yeah, well, I don't care. This is not, I mean, I don't know what other photos I have, but this, this isn't as cold as m many of my photographs. Uh, well, it looks like uh, looks like that's that's it. We've gone through. Well, the other photos that are like South Pole pictures, and you know, that's cold. So that was nothing. And and I love your um, I love your penguin photos as well. Thank you so much. Who doesn't love penguins? Yeah. <laughs> how can how can you not like penguins? Just smile exactly. and wave. Smile. And wave. <laughs> yeah, they're. I mean, I, we could talk uh, over drinks sometime, but, you know, when I was at the South Pole, and you, the emperor penguins are in a very unusual place. It's hard, they're hard to get to. And I remember I arrived at this colony, and honestly, the penguins just looked at me and all came over to say hi. And it was really, they're cool creatures, cool creatures. Well, uh, so, so just before we go, uh, can we talk photo camera stuff for a moment? Sure. So you have, you... Have, have you switched now from the Leica to the Sony a7S with Leica lenses? Uh, well, uh, I guess I would say, you know, when we talk about cameras, um, you know, I try to use the right tool for the right job. So that photo you just saw, um, I wouldn't take that photo with a Leica. I would take that photo with a, you know, Nikon D800E or D10. Um, so nature photography, I think SLRs are the most appropriate. But the, mo the primary kind of photography I shoot is street photography or portraits of people. And that's where I'm using a Leica lens, a 50 millimeter f.95 lens, really narrow depth of field. And with adapters, you can put it on a lot of bodies. And mostly I used an M8 or a Leica M8 or Leica M9 or M240. But recently, I've been using the Sony a7S, and it's a really incredible camera. And, you know, i kind of sad because I love my Leica body. It's so beautiful. But this Sony a7S is probably the best little camera I've ever used. It shoots at high ISO. It works really well. The technology is great. The images come out great. Um, Sony's doing some things right. Okay. Well, Vala, uh, we're, we're over time. Uh, we could you go know, on this, for a long time. This may have not been uh, episode 100, but one of my favorite episodes. Uh, Thank you so much. Really, really inspiring. Yeah, I loved it. You guys are great. Thank you. It's well. It's it's you know for us it's the highlight of our week. And but usually what we like to do is gang up and taunt my my glorious co-host. That's not true. We'll leave that for the weekend. We'll leave that for the weekend. <laughs> Actually, he taunts me. Uh, well, you have you have been watching episode number ninety eight of CXO Talk, and our guest today has been Chris Michael, who is a serial entrepreneur. He's invested in a bunch of companies, and as you've seen, is a really fabulous photographer. I'm Michael Krigsman with my glorious co-host Vala Offshore. Vala, we're supposed to get like what another foot of snow here. Uh, it's only six, seven feet in the last month. No big deal. <laughs> so my, my friendly and potentially snowed-in co-host, Vala Offshore, I'm Michael Kriegsman. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will see you next time on CXO Tech. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.